You know, the ocean and the sea is a place of joy and beauty. Millions of people go there every year for vacation and relaxation. I've done it many times myself. However, on December 26, 2004, the sea caused one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. You remember it, I'm sure. A tsunami wave of up to 100 feet high swept across the coastlands of 14 countries around the Indian Ocean and killed 230,000 people. The massive power and the unpredictability of the sea is why many ancient people, especially the Jews, saw it as a symbol of evil. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture to you out of Psalms and, uh, and uh, understand that what David is saying here about the water, about the sea, about the flood, he is speaking symbolically, okay? He's speaking symbolically about the waves and the flood and the storms that you and I face in our lives. In fact, you and I may well be facing a storm in our life right now. And I believe that God has a word for us. The first passage of Scripture is found in Psalm chapter 69, verses 1 and 2, and then in verses 14 and 15. Psalm 69, we'll begin reading at verse 1 and read verse 2 and then drop down to verse 14 and 15. He says, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. He said, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Can you identify with that today? And then dropping down to verse 14. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me de be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. I want to read another passage of Scripture. Let's move forward about uh, eight or nine Psalms to Psalm chapter 77, verse 16. I want you to notice what he says right here in regard to this situation. It's talking about God. And this is what it says. The waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee, and they were afraid. Oh, hallelujah. The depths were also troubled. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word and to the remainder of this service today. One reason why the sea symbolizes chaos and destruction and evil is because the sea, uh, the, the place that the sea holds in the Jewish history and their understanding of things. You see, the sea, as I said, symbolizes the evil and the disorder that stood in opposition to their God who is a God of order and He is a God of beauty. Again, I know that you may be facing a storm today. You may be facing a flood. And, 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 and the God that you serve is a God of order. He is a God of you. And you may be wondering why, or you may be wondering how am I going to survive this storm? How am I going to survive this flood? Let me, let me give you some examples of what the Jewish mindset was. First of all, we read in Genesis chapter 1, you're familiar with that. It says, in the beginning. And then it begins to describe the earth. And it says that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That was the condition of the world. But then the Bible goes on to say, but then... 
The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I want you to know today how that you can survive the storm. I want you to understand today how you can deal with the flood. I want you to understand what God has provided for you when you go through those stormy places in your life. And the first thing that I want you to understand today is that in the midst of that chaotic condition in the beginning, it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. If God's Spirit moves upon us, it's going to help us in the midst of our flood. Hallelujah. And so the God of creation was able to bring order out of chaos. The Garden of Eden was the absolute opposite of the formless sea that we read about in Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to notice this right here. That the very first word that we hear about God in the Bible, God could have said anything about Himself that He wanted to say. He could have said that I am a holy God and truly He is a holy God. He could have said I am a God of love and truly today, yes, God is a God of love. He could have said I am a God of power and oh yes, I want you to know that God is a God of power. It's said in some that when the floods saw you, they trembled. That's how powerful our God is. That's how mighty our God is. But it doesn't say any of that. It says it later on in the scripture. But the very first word that we hear about God in the Bible, the very first thing that God wants us to understand about Him is that He is a God of order and that He can bring order out of chaos. That means that if your life is in chaos today, if you're going through troubles, if you're going through trials and tribulations, God wants you to understand that He can bring order in the midst of that chaos. Hallelujah. That's what He did when He saved you. Oh, praise God. Your life was a mess. But He saved you and He brought order in the midst of your chaotic condition in regard to sin. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, the peace and order that was established by God at that particular time was interrupted when man and woman broke their unity with God. And you know the story of Adam and Eve. They listened to the devil. They listened to the serpent. And all of that that God was done, had done was messed up. And once again, the world was plunged and thrown into darkness and chaos. And, and we deal with that today. The reason that our nation, our world is going through the things that it's going through today it, it, it is, I, I hope I don't say the wrong thing right, but it's really not a political issue. It is a spiritual issue. Man is thrown in the darkness and they live in this darkness and they operate in this darkness and there's got to be a cure that is greater than politics. That's greater than the economics. That's greater than Wall Street. There has got to be a cure. And I want you to know today that there is a cure in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! You are sitting on it. He's more than wonderful. I love that song. Praise God. Hallelujah. So again, today, the world we deal with is experiencing the repercussions of their failure. Oh, I'd love to go back and give Adam and Eve a piece of my mind. I'll tell you. And so we read in Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, and, and this is really a 2,000-year-old text. It's, it's the ancient text, but it's for the modern audience. Listen to what it says about the condition of the last days. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now listen to this description right here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fears, despisers of those that are good. Has there ever been a day in time in which there has been such a rebellion against the church, against the Bible, against God, against the things that are of God? We're experiencing that today. He said traitors, heady, 
high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. I'm telling you, I want you to know that the God that I serve, the God that I follow, the God that I live, He's still able to calm the storm. He's still able to bring order out of chaos. He's still able to create light in darkness. He's still able to bring light from death. Hallelujah. He's still able to deliver from those situations that are trying to wear you down and beat you down. That's the God that I serve. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a flood of evil, a flood of terror, a flood of fear, a flood of darkness, a flood of despair has been unleashed in this world today. On the other hand, I've given you the bad news now that they give you the good news. I've been talking about it for quite long, you know that. God, God has not abandoned this world. God has not abandoned you. Hallelujah. He has not abandoned you to chaos and to darkness and to destruction. It's not His will that you should live unvictoriously in the midst of all of these things. Because in Genesis chapter 6, we read about the flood but then we also read that God preserved for himself a remnant. And the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to know that in the midst of the blood, there is grace. And you can find that grace in him. Hallelujah. I need his grace today. God's grace is at Christ's extent. I need his grace today. When faith wrote, ordered all the Hebrew male babies to be thrown into the Nile River. The Bible says that Moses was put into a little basket and he survived the water. He floated above the water. Kind of like Noah and his ark in, in microcosm right there. But I'm telling you, it don't matter if you're Noah. It don't matter if you're Moses. There is an ark of safety for you. There is a place that God has for you. There, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there is the ministry and the help of God that God has for you. And, and, and then I read about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. And they come up against the Red Sea. And, and the Red Sea is before them. And Pharaoh is behind them. And, and, and they don't know what to do but then. All of a sudden, God sent a strong east wind and it parted the waters and they went across on dry ground. Hallelujah. And when Pharaoh and his army assayed to do the same thing, the Bible says that the flood came in on them and destroyed them. I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, child of God, I'm telling you, believer, that there is a place in God, you as a child of God, whereas the world can't go there, you can. You, 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 they may not be able to walk where you can walk, but you can walk. And you can walk on dry ground, and the water can be on the right side, and the water can be on the left side, but you'll make it through. But when the world tries to do it, they can't do it because they're not in covenant with God, but you are in covenant with God. Hallelujah! He loves you and He cares about you. Y'all are probably in trouble because it's been a while since I preached. <laughs> with the COVID. I'm going to do my best to behave myself and, and uh, get through this in an orderly way. But uh, to God be the glory. What I'm trying to say is this. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up the standard against you. Hallelujah. 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 I like what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 43. Listen. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, 
I have called thee by thy name. Yes. Thou art mine. Now he's saying this to Israel. But it has application to us today. I want you to understand that. Verse 2. He says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Yes. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. He is your Savior today. He has not stopped being your Savior. He will never ever quit being your Savior. You can trust and depend upon Him and know that it's going to be taken care of. So God is greater than the flood. God is greater than the darkness. He's greater than the water. He's greater than the storm. He's greater than the destruction. He's even greater than the perilous times of the last days in which we live. I've heard y'all say it many times already today. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. I'm blessed. I'm riding down the road. Sugar cream. And every once in a while I see on the on these telephone poles. It simply says, Jesus saves. Yes. Yes. Jesus saves. So I start praying. I said, Lord, please anoint that sign. Lord, please anoint the ones that will look at that sign. Lord, please let the ones that will look at that sign begin to appropriate the things that that sign says into their life. Let them believe it. Let them try, and let it be changed and transformed in a moment's time right down the road in their car when they understand that Jesus saved. He is the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to heaven but by me. Hallelujah. Jesus is not just the way. He's the only way. He's not just the life. He's the only life. He's not the truth. He is the only truth. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is the answer to all that ails this world today. Because you see, I read over in Mark chapter 4. I read how that Jesus is on a boat. And He's asleep in the boat. And He told His disciples earlier, let us pass over to the other side. So they get on this boat and they're going across and he's asleep. He's been ministering all day long. Which certainly shows his humanity. And there's a storm and he's asleep. Which certainly shows that the way we can live through the midst of the storm. We can, there, there is a rest in God yes. even in the midst of the storm. Please hear me. But they wake him up and they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he rebukes the wind and the wave and says, Peace be still. And there's, there's, there's a great call. Jesus asked them two questions. Why is it that you're so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? And, and, and that's, that's a pretty tough question, two of them, that Jesus would ask. Because man, we, the reason that we're fearful is we're in the middle of the storm. And the reason that we have no faith is we're doing all we can to get to the other side and we're not getting anywhere and the storm's beating us and, and, and so, we, you know, we, we got problems. <laughs> Fast forward two chapters, Mark chapter 6. Again, Jesus has been ministering all day long. He sends His disciples on the boat ahead of Him. He sends the crowd away and then the Bible says that he goes into a mountain to pray. After he's prayed, he looks and he sees that the disciples are on the sea in the turbulence of the sea. They're tossed to and fro. And the Bible says that Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Oh, glory. What's their problem? The problem is the water, mainly. The problem is the storm. What does Jesus do? Jesus comes walking to the storm. On the water. Oh, praise God. That which was causing their problem, Jesus walked on top of it. <laughs> you and I, <laughs> you and I may be in the boat, tossed to and fro by, 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 the, by the storm. 
But Jesus can walk over the top of it. And he will walk over the top of it just to get you. But then the Bible says something very, very interesting right here. It says, he would have passed them by. But what stopped him? Listen now. They begin to cry out unto Jesus. And when they cried out unto Jesus, when he, when he got on the boat, immediately the storm was over. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. The attitude of the disciples is one of fearfulness, no faith, they're troubled, and when we look at the two stories together, the Bible even says their hearts were hardened. You've got to be careful about storms. Because if you don't handle them the right way and let God help you or let God give to you the things that He's given, it, it, will, it, it has a tendency to harden your heart. You've got to be careful. God, God's, God's teaching us something in the middle of those storms. You've got to understand that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever experienced a storm in your life in the past and survived it because of God? Would you raise your hand? Has God changed? No, God hasn't changed. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're going to survive this one too. Now, Jesus is the one. He's the peacemaker. He, he, he calms most storms. And, 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 and the text makes it clear that Jesus is frustrated with the response of the disciples' fearful, hard hearts. I mean, he, he, he's very frustrated with those disciples to the chaotic waters. Why? Why? Why is Jesus frustrated with them? Okay, good question. And, and why can Jesus handle the storms? And what can we learn from him in regard to the way that he handled those storms? Here it is. Mark chapter 4, the first storm. Before this storm even started. When you look at Mark chapter 4, you will notice that Jesus all day long has been giving them the Word of God. He has been giving them the Word of God. And He tells them, He tells them, He said there's all kinds of ground that this Word can go into. Hard ground, rocky ground, uh, thorny ground, but then there's good ground. And Jesus wants you and me to be the good ground that He can plant the seed of His Word into our lives that will bring forth fruit, praise God. But it seems like it said that, that, that you know, that the disciples weren't, weren't getting it. All right? So He's given them the Word. And listen, what did I say just a moment ago? Jesus said, this is the Word just as much as anything else is the Word. Jesus said, let us. Yes. yes. Pass over yes. to the other side. Yes. That's the word of God. That's the same word that Jesus has given to you when you got on this boat and started this journey with Jesus. Yes. He said, let us pass over to the other side. You don't get to the other side at the bottom of the lake. You don't get to the other side overcome by the storm. You get to the other side by getting to the other side. Jesus is going to get to the other side. And he said, let us pass over to the other side. That is the word of God. Hallelujah. Because when they woke him up, he simply said, peace be still. Three words. Great goodness of God. There's such power in And it was over. Dear friend, if you want to know how 
to survive the flood and the storms that may be in your life. Get in this word. Yes. Stay in this word. Yes. Live by this word. Yes. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. And I believe that that standard is this word of God. And when the word of God says, let us pass over to the other side, you can look at the storm and say, rage all you want to. Blow all you want to. Rain all you want to. I'm going to the other side of Jesus. Because the word of God said, I can make it. Hallelujah. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's what the word says. No glory. Second story. I'm getting close to the end right here. Second story. I told you, they got him in a boat, sent him to the other side, didn't go with him, sent the crowd away. He went to the mountain to pray. And then later on, he looks and he sees that they're being tossed to and fro in the sea in the storm. And the Bible says he comes walking with them on the water. I talked about that. And I say it, and it says, it says in that text, it says, he would have passed them by. What? Jesus, I'm in the middle of a storm. I'm struggling, Lord. I mean, I'm going through it, Lord. And Lord, you're going to pass me by? That's what it says. I'm not making it up It's in there. What stopped Jesus from passing them by? Here it is. The Bible says, and they cried out unto him. Yes, yes, yes. Now, when you read Psalms and other places in the Bible, the idea of crying unto the Lord is the same thing as saying they begin to pray. Yes, yes. They begin to call upon the Lord. They begin to say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your deliverance. Lord, I need your victory. If you don't help me, this storm is going to get me. And they cried out unto him, and he stopped, and he got on the boat, and the storm was over. Glory! There's something about prayer. Oftentimes, Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble right here, but uh, okay. Oftentimes, when we're facing storms and problems, we try everything but God. We do everything but pray. We, 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 we'll go through the whole litany of what is available. We'll try this, we'll try that, we'll try the other thing. Somebody say amen right there. But I found in the years that I've lived that when I'm in the middle of a storm, I'll go to God in prayer. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that the storm's always over, but I find that there is peace. That passes all understanding in the midst of my storm. And I know that sooner or later, it's going to be over. It, 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 it's, it's, it's going to be over. When Jesus said, that's it, that's it. I'm no more, no more. Praise God, praise God. Hey, hey, now listen, the disciples within three chapters faced two storms. It's the way it goes. That's just like. But the, what, what we're trying to say right here is that God has given us the victory over the storm. The Bible says when the flesh looked at you, they were afraid of you. They trembled in your presence. Hallelujah. That's what God is able to do. Now, I know this is simple. Stay in the Word and pray. Yes. Right. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Garden of Gethsemane. And then I'm closing. The Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is facing the toughest night of his life. He's having to, he's having to accept what's getting ready to happen. And he goes, he, 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 he takes three disciples a certain uh, portion. He tells them to pray. And then he goes on a little bit further by himself. He begins to pray. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's saying all of this because Jesus understands where the battle of the storm is won. Where there's peace in the midst of the storm. He understands where there's peace in the midst of the storm. He begins to pray. Nevertheless, not my will, but my will be done. And you know what happened, of course. We already talked about that. So, Jesus shows us the example right there that we need to understand. Get into the Word and pray. And you, there's grace there, the Spirit of God moves, you and I, that's how you're going to survive the storm, that's how I'm going to survive the storm. Would you stand together with us, boys? Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't go too long. I said it's been a while since I preached. I was honored to be at Eastway Church of God. To fill in for my dear friend and Carter. We've known each other for a long time. A long time. I, and I don't know what the protocol is, so I want to simply do my best to follow the protocol that I, I, I think is right right here. You know, normally uh, we used to we used to come around the altar. I don't know if we still do that, but out of respect for uh, just the situation right here, we will not do that. But this morning, if you're going through a storm, I want you to know how you can survive that storm. And I want to pray for you this morning. Praise the Lord. I want you to pray with me. We said prayer is one of the keys right there. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, I come unto you in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. The name that is above principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. The name that can call the storm. The name that can stop the storm. Hallelujah. I come unto you in the name of Jesus this morning. And Lord, you know every one of these people. You saw those disciples that night on the on the on, on the on the sea being tossed to and fro. And you see, you see these people this morning being tossed to and fro by the storms of their life. But Lord, would you come to them in the midst of their storm and, 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 and as they trust in your word and believe in your word and hope in your word and as they call upon you this morning, Lord, would you touch them today? Would you help them, Lord? Find, <laughs> find some peace. Hallelujah. 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 Peace. Peace.
feasted on it. Experience that peace this morning in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Experience that peace. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. While Jim sings it, and you may know it, let's worship him. Hallelujah.